All right, so we finished up uh, chemical bonding and naming. And so if you want to reflect back, we started with matter. We learned how to separate matter into substances and mixtures. Then we focused in on substances and looked at elements. Then from elements, we've looked at compounds. And next, we're going to take those compounds and we're going to start to look at reactions. And then how do we keep track of those uh, quantities? So how do we measure out mass and uh, some new stuff, mole? We'll be talking about that in this chapter. So in this chapter, uh, we're going to be looking at chemical change and focusing on chemical re reactions, how to write chemical equations. Then we'll learn to balance those equations. We'll then talk about types of reactions. Then we'll focus on oxidation and reduction. And then finally, we'll look at the mole. From the mole, we'll go to molar masses. And then if you're in Chem 110, we'll be going on to look at mole relationships and chemical equations, mass calculations for the reactions, and last but not least, energy and chemical reactions. So in this segment, we're going to introduce you to chemical reactions and possibly balancing. All right. So all chemical reactions have two parts. In the beginning, we have the reactants. These are the substances that we're going to start with. And then we'll finish with the products, and those are the substances we're going to end up with. In essence, there's lots of different ways I could say it, but basically the reactants are going to turn into the products. Now, even though all of our chemical reactions start with a sentence, the ending will look more like this, where we're going to have some chemical compounds with an arrow pointing towards the products. Now, the arrow will always point towards the products. All right. So in a chemical reaction, what's going to happen is the things that we start with are going to be broken down into atoms and then rejoined to make new things. In this process, the atoms cannot be created or destroyed. So whatever we start with, we'll have to end up with. And again, we can describe them in several ways, chemical reactions that is. We can describe it using a sentence, something like copper reacts with chlorine to form copper two chloride. And right away, you can see naming coming back to haunt you. So if you haven't been practicing your naming and you haven't been getting naming down, all of a sudden it's going to get real complicated real fast. So you can't just push that off to the side and say, okay, I didn't understand it. I didn't learn it, whatever. I'm going to keep moving. Nope. I'm going to need you to go back and figure out naming. Just come spend some time with me if you need to, get the tutor, whatever it may take, but you have to get naming down in order to move forward. Now, the first thing we're going to do is take the sentence and turn it into just a word equation so I can introduce the new pieces to you. So naming is not a new piece, but some of the symbols and terminology that we're going to use in a reaction will be. So the first thing we're going to do is get rid of some of the words. Copper plus chlorine, arrow, copper to chloride. That is the chemical formula for copper reacts with chlorine to form copper to chloride. So what are some of the symbols then? Well, you're always going to see an arrow in a chemical reaction. And the arrow is simply separating the reactants from the products. And there's all sorts of vocabulary we can use. Typically, it's something like reacts to form, or it could be reacts with, or is mixed with um, to produce, things like that. The plus sign is typically and. So this and that are used to make this and that, right? So um, if you have four pieces in your reaction, A plus B goes to C plus D, then you would have this and this react to form this and that. Now, the other thing we'll do in a chemical reaction is tell you physical state. And so if you see a little S in parentheses after the formula, so if it was NaCl and then a little S in parentheses afterwards, we're telling you we used solid sodium chloride, right? If I use a little g, then that means we've used a gas. And of course, an L would mean a liquid. Now, another thing we'll do in chemistry is if I take solid sodium chloride and I try to react it, a lot of times that won't react. The solid phase does not allow for the reaction. However, what I could do is take that sodium chloride and dissolve it in water. And when we do that, we'll put a little AQ afterwards. So now we can see that we've taken the solid and dissolved it in water. And so we use AQ, aqueous. It's an aqueous solution. All right, so the arrows. Sometimes we'll see double-headed arrows, such as this one. What this means is that we have a reversible reaction. 
Now we'll talk more about this when we get to acids and bases, um, but for now, just know that it's meaning that we can go back and forth, back and forth. Most arrows simply say we're going from direction A to direction B. Now sometimes we'll throw like a word like heat or energy on top of that, or possibly even a little triangle. That's simply saying that we had to supply some sort of heat or energy to the reaction to get it to go. Sometimes you'll see another chemical symbol on top of the top on top of the arrow. This means that we've used a catalyst, and platinum is a very common catalyst, especially for organic chemistry. And so if we see a platinum on top, that means we've simply used platinum as a catalyst. And of course, we can just review a little bit what was a catalyst. Well, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction without being changed by the reaction. Now, that's not quite true. A lot of times the catalyst can be used up, but in theory, we would be able to collect all of the catalyst back and put it separate separated out of the reaction. Now, the way this is done, the way we see the speeding up is by the lowering of an activation energy. So if I draw a coordinate for a reaction, and so here we have our reactants, they're going to react, and they're going to go up this hill, and then they're going to come back down the hill and form products. And this is an energy diagram. So we're looking at energy going up. So higher up means higher energy. From here to here, so from where the reactant started to the top of the hill, is the activation energy, E sub A. Now what a catalyst will do is find a different path. So rather than coming all the way up here, maybe the catalyst says, I'm gonna bend right here and give you a different direction. And so that's why we see it speed up. It can get up the hill a lot faster because the hill is not as tall. And that's exactly how enzymes and biological and protein catalysts are gonna work in your biology courses, okay? They're gonna give a different pathway for the reaction to take place. Now, before we go further looking at reactions, there's another topic we need to hit, and that's going to be diatomic elements. Diatomic elements, unfortunately, you're going to have to commit to memory. There's just no other way to get around it. Now, for diatomics, what we're saying is, is there are eight elements that never want to be alone, and so they're going to form diatomic molecules. Those elements are going to be hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astonine. Basically, it's all the ogens and all the enes, okay? Now, the reason why you have to commit these to memory is because if I take hydrogen and oxygen and I react them to form water, you'll have to know that the hydrogen is diatomic. You'll have to know that it's H2. There's no other way. There's nothing that's going to tell you that it's H2 other than just memorizing one way or another. So the one thing would be to learn the endings, ogens and enes. Another would be that we have the 1 plus 7 pattern on the periodic table. And so if I look at the periodic table, and I've used yellow here, and hopefully you can see this, and if not, you know what, I'll just go ahead and write on here where they are. So hydrogen is the one. Remember, this is the one plus seven rule. Then I'm going to come over here, and here's nitrogen. Nitrogen is element number seven. Okay, and then we have oxygen, and we have fluorine. And that's going to make the top of our seven. And then this is group 7A. And so under fluorine, we're going to have chlorine. Then we're going to have bromine. Then we're going to have iodine. And then finally, astonine. Those are your eight diatomics. All right. So again, the way the best way to remember it is the one plus seven. And then we have this yellow seven here. And again, if you're not able to see the yellow, I've now marked them in, unfortunately, with red. So you might still be struggling. If so, let me know. Send me an individual email. I'll make sure to change the coloring around here so you can see it without a problem. All right. Now, once we have naming down, we've taken our sentence and we've turned it into a word sentence or a word formula. The next thing to do is to get rid of the words and go straight to a skeleton equation. So now a skeleton equation is going to use only formulas and symbols. So we'll have no English words, no words at all. Now this won't indicate how many of each thing is there, but it will describe the reaction itself. Remember all chemical equations are simply sentences that are describing an actual observable reaction. So let's go ahead and convert some equations. All right, so solid iron three sulfide reacts with gaseous hydrogen chloride to form iron two chloride and hydrogen sulfide gas. 
So what we want to do is just break it down piece by piece. So we might have to use our naming rules and figure out what iron three sulfide is, but we'll take iron three sulfide and we'll figure out that that's Fe2S3. I'll put a little S after it because it tells me that it's a solid. Now it tells me it's going to react with. So what symbol would I use for react with? Well, these things are going to go together. So it's this and that, and that's going to be my plus symbol. Now, what's it reacting with? Gaseous hydrogen chloride. So again, I'll have to use my word, uh, my naming systems and figure out what hydrogen chloride is, and that's going to be HCl. We're told it's a gas, and so I'll put a little G after that. And then it says it's to form. Okay, that's my arrow, right? Because it's this and this are going together to form that. So that's going to be my arrow for my products. Then the products we say to form iron to chloride. So once again, I have to go back to naming. Chloride, it's chlorine, it's a minus one. Iron it tells me it's two, it's plus two. So that's going to be FeCl2. Now notice it didn't tell me the physical state. And at these levels, I wouldn't expect you to know what that physical state is. So in this case, we're going to leave it blank, right? Then it tells me we're also going to make and hydrogen sulfide gas. And so we have hydrogen sulfide, sulfur, minus two, hydrogen plus one, crisscross those, and I get H2S. Now it tells me it's a gas. So at this point, I've left it up to you. Um, you can put a little G there. Um, one of the things I've kind of omitted from the slideshow these days is we use arrows sometimes. So here we would just put a little G in after that as well. All right, hopefully that all made sense and you're catching on to it. And so I'm gonna give you one to do on your own. So here's nitric acid dissolved in water, reacts with sodium, solid sodium carbonate to form liquid water and carbon dioxide gas and sodium nitrate dissolved in water. Now we haven't talked about um, acid naming yet. So I'm gonna give you the formula for nitric acid. That's gonna be HNO3. And now what I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead and pause the video, maybe take out a piece of paper and give this a try. And so I'll give you a pause here just for a moment so that you have a place to pick up and start from. All right. So hopefully you've unpaused it. And now you're going to have a reaction that looks something like this. We're going to have HNO3. There's nitric acid. It's dissolved in water. So that's going to be AQ. And then it says reacts with, that's going to be a plus sign, solid sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is going to be Na2CO3. And again, you might need to review naming to get these formulas. If you mess up the formulas, um, then you are going to be describing a different reaction. So you really want to make sure you're getting the formulas correct. We're told this was a solid. To form is going to be my arrow. Liquid water. Now that seems weird to say liquid water, but I could have made gaseous water. That tells me a lot about the temperature of the reaction. So we're not having a, a reaction that's got so much heat coming off that's converting the water into a gas, right? It's staying as a liquid. And carbon dioxide gas. So that's going to be CO2. And I'll put a little G after that for gas. And, and I'm running out of space here, so I'm just going to come down here a little bit, and sodium nitrate. That's going to be NaNO3. And that's dissolved in water, and so we're going to put AQ after that one. All right, so that's how we get from sentences to reactions. Hopefully you're doing okay with that. Next, what we're going to do is look at the idea of balancing our chemical equations. So if I look at the one we just finished, or I look at this one here, you can easily see, hey, you told me, Mr. Caro, that I can't create or destroy any atoms. But when I look at this reaction, here we have two irons, and over here we only have one. Right, and you can't create or destroy them. So we have to figure out then how to get that to work out. And what we do is we do balancing. We balance our chemical equations. And so since we're at about the 15 minute mark, I'm going to go ahead and stop this segment here, and then we'll do a segment on balancing equations.